Good evening, everyone. My name is Eric B. Anderson. I prefer he, him pronouns. I am the secretary of the education committee for the San Diego chapter of DSA. Welcome to the fourth episode of our then and now series of night schools. Today, March 25th, is the is the International Day of Remembrance of the Victims of Slavery and the transatlantic slave trade. 15 million men, women, and children were victims of the worst violation of human rights in history, according to the UN. We hope that this presentation contributes to that conversation in the most meaningful, respectful, and reverential way possible. This is the B. Bruce Anderson Memorial flag in my hometown, Long Valley, New Jersey. There are nine baseball fields here, two large soccer fields, a football field, and a community garden. My father died around the same time this park was being built over 20 years ago. We asked people to donate in lieu of flowers to the Boy Scout troop that he and I were founding members of. And two Eagle projects later, this is what they come up with. I don't mean to go deep into Lacanian psychoanalysis of the symbolic concept of the name of the father and what all that means, but in real life, when I consider the way that he died and the fact that I now have a lot of the symptoms of the same disease that he had, knowing that his name is real and out there for everyone to see and that it is and it, that it will be protected by the government if necessary for potentially hundreds of years, sometimes it's a dose of sanity in an insane world, and I'm sorry that not everyone gets to have this privilege. I try to use my middle initial when I introduce myself because it's the same as my father's first initial, and it comforts me to know that it's on his monument. Right now, I'd like to draw your attention to some other initials on this plaque, and they are NJ. The J stands for Jersey because the original British colony of New Jersey was named after the ancestral home of Sir George Carteret. And since 1664, Carteret was the first Lord Proprietor of East Jersey. And before that, according to a columnist at the Jersey Evening Post in the UK, he was the founder of the Royal African Company that went on to ship more African slaves to the Americas than any other institution in the history of the Atlantic slave trade. What I'm trying to say is, that a group that if a group of committed individuals were to petition the Washington Township Committee to remove my father's monument because of that little cursed J, I'm ready to have that conversation. That whole park is a sacred space to me, but if they did their due diligence, put me on the record right now, I would not object. I've gotten everything I need out of that monument. Maybe they'll let me take it home. I'm being completely serious, but honestly. There are a lot larger monuments that need to be reckoned with. Here's a quick survey of the most significant cursed monuments in the United States. This massive Confederate monument on, it's supposed to be Stone Mountain. Boy. Uh, Stone Mountain, yeah, there we go. On Stone Mountain, Georgia, it's not very well known outside of the region, but it continues to be a pilgrimage site for, for Proud Boys. Its sculptor, Gutzon Borglin, was a Ku Klux Klan member who was funded by the United Daughters of the Confederacy, a hereditary association that builds and continues to maintain monuments to the lost cause of the Confederacy. Borglin was a gambler and so in debt after building Stone Mountain that he needed to find a more ambitious project to pay it off. Here is Mount Rushmore. Oh, sorry. Here is Mount Rushmore. Borglum convinced somebody to invest in a 5,700-foot statue of four great men, two of them impregnated enslaved African women and enshrined words like merciless Indian savages into our founding documents. One was a skinny rich kid who manufactured consent for an imperial war with Spain to liberate, to quote-unquote liberate Cuba and the Philippines that was all just a massive photo op to make him look like a rough-riding cowboy. And even the great emancipator carried out the largest mass execution in U.S. history in 1862. Many of the Dakota people he killed that day had a five-minute trial, and at least two were found to have been a case of mistaken identity. To add insult to injury, they put his monument in South 
Dakota. In Chicago in 1886, labor organizers fighting for the eight-hour day were bombed by terrorists, then murdered by police, and then framed for those murders and executed during the Haymarket Affair. But what kind of monument was built in Haymarket Square? A giant symbol of state violence in a police uniform, of course. Every day at sports events, the American National Anthem ends with a rousing sentimental land of the free and the home of the brave. But how many people eating their hot dogs and Cracker Jacks are even thinking about the United States having the highest per capita non-free prison population in the entire world and that the U.S. Constitution encourages this? And here in California, fourth graders in secular schools have been taught for decades to revere the Christian missionaries who exploited, enslaved, and utterly decimated 90% of the indigenous population in one generation after California became a state. Learn more about this by watching our previous night school hosted by Heather about slavery in San Diego. In San Diego, <clears throat> there have been schools, parks, museums, post offices, Statues and plaques honoring Christopher Columbus, Jefferson Davis, Robert E. Lee, a conquistador priest named Juniper, Junipero Serra, and our seventh president, Andrew Jackson. According to historian H.W. Brands, Andrew Jackson holds the national record for most monuments in the United States for some reason. Part two. Henry Clay was a Kentucky senator who authored the bill that made California state, but also the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 that made it possible for so-called slave catchers to hunt runaways in quote-unquote free states, including California. In personal letters, he claimed that slavery was wrong, but he never freed his the enslaved in his own house. One block away from where I'm sitting right now, there is a neighborhood park and an elementary school named after Henry Clay. They tried to disguise it with the mural of the Dalai Lama, Nelson Mandela, and a chimpanzee friend, but under his name. But it's not a monument to them. There's another mirror, mural nearer to the entrance of the school. It looked about 20 feet tall when I took this photo last week. I might as well encourage children in the name of school spirit to say, I am a human trafficker. Last year, my friends Brian and Gerard, both parents at Clay, went on the evening news to promote their petition to rename Clay Elementary. Check them out on the front page of the Union Tribune last week, by the way. Brian said his kids were never taught who Clay, who Henry Clay was. As I write this, the San Diego Unified Naming Committee and the Clay Elementary P PTA have been debating vigorously about what to change the name to. I'm not a parent, I'm not a teacher, but I was honored that Brian and Gerard asked me to get involved in their campaign. Part three, when I was in college in 1995, I went to Ghana and West Africa. The biggest highlights of the trip by far were visiting Mensa village seen here and touring slave castles in Cape Coast and Elmina. Mensa village was situated at a spot in the river where the enslaved would bathe for the last time before entering the dungeons of a nearby slave castle. This is a picture I took of an unmarked mass grave of the enslaved who either died in the castle or never even made it inside. Elmina Castle was built by the Portuguese in 1482. Christopher Columbus was present during the foundation ceremony. It is the oldest example of European architecture in Africa. If I told you all the stories that were told to me about this castle, I think they would need a trigger warning. Our tour, our tour, our tour guides told us that the, over, the overseers stood in this balcony and made decisions, including who they want to SA every night. The sign next to this door says female dungeon. We were told that enslaved people were stacked in chains on top of each other in this room. The line down the middle of the floor was the only conduit for draining sewage. 
If they survived here for six weeks, only then would they be considered strong enough to be loaded into even tighter quarters on the slave ships for their transatlantic journey. As part of the museum experience, our group was locked into the room seen here with the skull and crossbones for a full minute. This, more than anything, is what I think about when I remember this trip. A little more background about myself. In 1996, I worked in a history museum in Pennsylvania. I organized a protest rally outside of William F. Buckley's speech. I got him to say, the world is a giant ashtray. We put things in. And then 300 rich people with nice watches shouted at me to go home, even though I lived on campus. It felt awful and also great. And that summer, I was invited by the Western Ancient Forest Campaign to stay in D.C. to lobby Congress about an environmental justice bill. We lost by two votes, but I was fired up. I don't have any pictures of it, but in 2004, I went to Marad Bay, Jamaica, with the same group of professors I went to Ghana with. We visited the courthouse where Paul Bogle, the Jamaican hero who organized the Marat Bay Slave Rebellion in 1865, was hanged. I'll never forget, no way, they turned their backs on Paul Bogle. Part 4. In 2015, I moved to my current neighborhood in Rolando, San Diego, and immediately beheld a, a bizarre sight. My very own post office is named after our most notorious president, Andrew Jackson. I read a history book about him once. He was a skilled general, the founder of Tennessee. He expanded our territory more than anybody and is probably responsible for saving our country from bankruptcy, but at what cost? He forcibly marched whole Indian tribes west of the Mississippi and what became known as the Trail of Tears and personally enslaved 161 souls. Maybe we deserve to go bankrupt. I never imagined that there would be anything I could do about this post office, but in June 2020, monuments to slavery and colonialism around the globe were being removed, renamed, and even toppled by angry mobs in the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd. I remember the old slogan, think globally, act locally, and started looking for monuments near me that needed to be taken down. I had found an older petition to remove a Confederate monument at Mount Hope Cemetery in San Diego, but that monument was on private property purchased by the Daughters of the Confederacy. So I tried to think about other monuments. That's when I remembered my post office. And so I started my petition. Because of all that was going on, with George Floyd, it was like riding a wave. It started as a post on Nextdoor, then I took it to change.org and posted it on social media, all over social media. On a Saturday night, I sent it to some news outlets, and it was on CBS News on Sunday evening. The petition had over 300 signatures on it in 24 hours. I declined to be on camera that time, but the very next day, Dave Summers from NBC NBC7 was knocking on my door. I didn't even give him my address, but this is a big opportunity. I couldn't turn him away. I still hate the way I look and sound, but I'm glad I did it because that was the story that got the petition count up over a thousand. And that Thursday, circumstances put me in the right place at the right time to be on KUSI as well. Things felt quite slow for a while after that, but I just kept posting on social media and hand-billing flyers like this one around the neighborhood. Eventually, a columnist from the Union Tribune saw my flyer at Clay Park and wrote half an article about the campaign, and newly elected Sarah Jacobs made her first public statement in favor of the renaming. From there, my city councilman, Sean Ela Rivera, organized a public survey with the help of the Orlando Community Council. In the second round of the survey, three respectable restorative names related to civil rights were selected, but the one that got the most votes was the predictable, bland, boring, non-restorative choice, Rolando Post Office. And But almost a year later, I got a heads up from a staffer at Sarah Jacobs' office Apparently, due to some, type, some kind of internal congressional rule, 
that seemed to make sense but was never actually shown to me they had to name it after another person and if this new person were still alive it would it would have to be either a wounded combat vet or an active or former member of congress over the age of 75 and there was only one person that could be representative jacob's mentor recently retired rep susan davis rep jacobs had all already gotten all 53 mem members of the california delegation to co-sponsor hr 9308 but nobody mentioned the former name of the post office which i think was quite shrewd they probably still think they only voted for voted to name it after their former colleague loops loose lips sink ships as they say the republicans in california weren't going to support it if they knew the real reason for for it was to rename the Andrew Jackson Post Office. At the renaming ceremony last July, Representative Jacobs mentioned my name as the man who started the petition. I should have been euphoric. But a few things happened that were very weird. First, my invitation to the ceremony got trapped in a spam filter. I didn't even know that there was a ceremony until after my name was in the paper again. That was personally very annoying, but the second thing is just wild. Public Law 117-314 states, any reference in a law, map, regulation, document, paper, or other record of the United States, the facility at 6401 Alcohol Boulevard shall be deemed the Susan A. Davis Post Office. There's a nice new plaque on the inside of the building that says that. But on the outside, facing the public, 24 hours a day, right now, and 100 times the size of the plaque, there is a reference to the facility, and it doesn't say Susan A. Davis Post Office. The, the post office web, website calls it by another name as well. If that's not a violation of federal law, I don't know what is. And so I started a new petition to take the signage down, but TV stations aren't calling for interviews. I honestly don't even know who to send it to, really. To get an injunction in court, a plaintiff would need to have standing, but who is injured here? We all are symbolically, but try telling that to a judge. Susan Davis told a reporter that a whole new appropriations bill would, would be needed to take the sign down, but that's hogwash. A janitor could take the letters off the side of the building right now. Someone is already getting paid to update the website. Just do it already. Even if it's only on paper, the post office is renamed. It will never again officially be the Andrew Jackson Post Office, but I will never pledge my allegiance to Susan Davis. As a means to an end, it's great. Well, I mean, it's fine, but is it great? I don't know. Um, Susan Davis has not been a friend to the working class. Her offices were occupied twice for a reason. She's She's not as bad as Andrew Jackson. No American is, but no one is going to be petitioning to change it again. It wouldn't be possible according to some other rules that I've read. It's the tree in a forest, it's a tree in a forest situation now, in a way. If a monument is renamed, but the signage never comes down, has it been has it truly been renamed? I would encourage you to call your representatives and ask them to finish the job. Part five. There are always unexpected and unintended consequences to anything anybody tries to do in politics. We can't promise that anything will work, but we put together some simple suggestions on how to get started. An extended version of this list will be made available during the discussion portion of the presentation. But in the meantime, here are some steps on how to rename a monument. <clears throat> Step one, identify the monument. Think about your hometown, where you live now, where, where you went to school or somewhere else. Step two, identify the grievance. Why should it be removed? Spell it out, be clear, use reliable sources. Step three, identify the jurisdiction. Is the monument on municipal, county, state, federal, school, park, or private land? somewhere else maybe step four 
right? Identify the decision makers and obtain contact information and use it. Legislative, executive, judicial, school board, etc. They all have influence. Phone, fax, snail mail address, postcards, walk-ins, email. Email and text are not all there is. If you want to get their attention, get their attention. Do something unexpected. Step five, start a petition or draft a message. Change.org worked for me, but there are other methods. Representative Jacob mentioned the fact that I printed out the names and sent them by snail mail to her when she gave me credit at the ceremony. Postcards, forms, letters, flyers, social media, etc. Step six, spread the word. Buy stamps. Leave some flyers at the laundromat. Project your message on a building. Make a public comment at a planning board meeting. Take a Greyhound bus to D.C. and make an appointment with a staffer. I've done most of those things. Step seven, organize. If you're a student, there are plenty of groups made for this. If not, join a group like DSA, or if you are a student, join a group like DSA. There are plenty of other groups committed to advocacy that already have audiences for the message lined up. Ours has folks willing to phone bank and canvas neighborhoods for you if you need it. Step eight, run for office yourself. You're probably already better candidate than most of them. And if all else fails, remember these words from art crime professor Aaron Thompson in the book, Smashing Statues. Before you fault someone for not following the process, you have to be sure there is one. And when authorities refuse to listen to calls for removal, some people will think they have no choice but to topple a monument. We've done our due diligence. The bill to rename the post office went all the way. It passed the House by two-thirds majority. It unanimously passed the Senate, and it was enthusiastically signed by the President of the United States. But this, the Andrew Jackson sign still, still stays up. And for the record, I'm not giving anyone advice to do anything on their own about this. If somebody takes it into their own hands, it wasn't me. That's the and that is the end of our presentation. Thank you for allowing me to be a part of this timeless global global conversation. I look forward to continuing the story on and on as Bayard Rustin says down the line. Most of you here have signed the petition to take the Andrew Jackson signage down already. There is also a petition to rename Clay Park and Clay Elementary, still accepting signatures. Here are the URLs and the QR codes and all that. Um, and Heather will lead the discussion period next. And I want to thank Heather also for an amazing production job. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Eric. That was a great presentation, very informative. Um, we will now kick off the discussion portion of the session. I'm just going to set this up so that you all have the ability to unmute yourselves. Um, if you are interested, if you have a question or a comment, please type stack in the chat or raise your hand in Zoom and we will take your comments in the order that they appear. And um, while you are doing that, let's begin with these questions. Have you ever attempted to remove or rename a monument? Or do you know of a monument that deserves to be removed? I'll put these questions in the chat too, so that you can read those. It's a lot to take in. And while you are taking a moment to consider those questions, I'm also going to post another link in the chat. Um, the link I just posted will take you to a worksheet that was created for you um, by the Education Committee to use as a guide when you want to have a monument removed or renamed. Uh, there's a link at the top of the document that will create a copy of the document 
for your use that you can save to your Google Drive and fill out as you go through the process, make whatever edits and notes that you'd like to do. Um, we have Brian Jenkins on stack. Go ahead, Brian, make sure you unmute yourself. All right, can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, first off, I just wanna say thank you, Eric, for that wonderful presentation. And um, maybe the, the question I wanted to ask you, Eric, is I think when, when you set out to do this project, you know, there's obviously this, uh, like the, the, the initial goal or like kind of the focus is to change the name of the monument. But I was curious um, what else was gained along the way, like maybe like whether it's building community or, or what that looks like. That maybe you didn't expect. Okay, it's a great question, Brian. And be, in case anybody didn't realize, uh, I mentioned Brian is one of the uh, organizers of the Clay, uh, renamed Clay, Clay Elementary School. And he was, um, I mentioned him couple times in the during the presentation uh what did I what let's see what what can you put it in the chat again it's what did I what didn't I expect uh like some unusual motivations yeah I moved to San Diego about eight years ago and like you know I didn't know anybody you know um kind of moved for financial reasons and you know I'm on disability and so I don't really know anybody and um I don't know. I definitely, definitely community and, and like you, your friendship and um, stuff, you know, it, it even it actually kind of felt a little lonely. Like you, for me personally, like when I started the petition, I got like 1400 signatures, but like for a long time, there's like nobody to even call or, you know, and like, uh, you know, but, um, you know, so I, but it was something to do in, in a kind of way. I needed a reason to get out of the, you know, to get out of the house or something, you know, like I, I am on disability and, you know, so, um, you know, a little, little depressing life, but, but, uh, yeah, it's just something to do, you know, kind of in a way and definitely, and, but, and I've absolutely found community. I found DSA, you know, I wanted to find, uh, people with like-minded, uh, uh, political views and, it's been real hard and, and but uh with DSA and with with the folks from Clay Elementary reaching out, um it's been it's I I I just been really grateful for it and uh in a you know, in a way it um I don't know, I can't say enough good things about it. So thank you all for being here and being my friends and community and you know, and also to be of service of others and not too much of my, you know, not too much of my own ego. You know, I really don't, I, I was so awkward when, um, like, I really didn't want to be on TV. And then the guy showed up at my house and I'm like, okay, I guess I'm the, the leader of this uh, particular, um, you know, the campaign. And uh, so it's a little awkward, but um, so far I'm trying to, keep my you know feet on the ground and but it's it's pretty uh, it's kind of amazing though to be able to you know I can pretty much say I passed the bill in Congress in a way because I started the petition but try to keep you know keep you know if it weren't for 1460 people to sign this petition and, and a lot more to um you know make it happen um anyway that's that's what I'm grateful for I I will I will stop talking and I hope, I hope other people can talk. Like I hope somebody can talk about, you know, some other monuments in their town and we can help. We want to help, uh, you know, look at all these other monuments and reckon with this stuff. So. Well, while they're thinking, Eric, um, okay. I have a question for you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so I know, I know you're working on the, uh, the, well, you worked on the post office and you're working on the clay uh, park and elementary school. Have you noticed anything else in your area or in the metro area um, that you're thinking about targeting next? Um, I, uh, but I'm, I, okay, so what I did in June 2020 was like I kind of obsessively collected news articles about 
all that was going on for the George Floyd riots and um and so like just keeping track of everything and I feel like I don't know if anyone any anything like in the immediate area that needs my attention exactly I, I'm very proud of um a lot of people um and that's sort of why we're, why we're at, we're looking for other people to just tell us where we can direct our attention but um um you know when okay so it's kind of a weird story but like back where i used to live in hackett sound new jersey there was a, a murder in 1886 and um tilly smith uh she was a kitchen worker a, a working class um young girl who was outraged at, at a at a um seminary school and uh they convicted this guy uh james titus and um he was a janitor he was um uh, and it was like it was like a trial of century i saw um i see brit on stack i'll try to finish this story uh, a little bit but i've seen an article about james titus being convicted in 1886 and but he was somebody i knew wrote a book and this guy didn't do it so um you know, I, I started a campaign to get a posthumous pardon, first posthumous pardon in New Jersey for James Titus. It, so far, it hasn't happened, but if you could check it out on Free James Titus on all various social media, it's been a while since anything's happened, but I'll let Britt talk. Thank you. Pass. Hello, everyone. Um, so I went on a hike a while ago that I just remembered. I wonder if anyone's been on it. It's called, I believe it's called Stonewall Trail or Stonewall Peak Trail. And I remember seeing the name at the time and thinking, oh, that's, I just, I like this name. It sounds like a cool name. I'm going to look into the history. And um, I just looked it up now and it says here on Wikipedia, Stonewall Peak was named after Stonewall Mine, which was, uh, Let's see. The mine was originally named Stonewall Jackson Mine after Confederate General Stonewall Jackson. Um, and so that made me really sad. And I remember feeling really <laughs> disappointed. Um, and so this this trail is located in Julian in Cuyamaca Rancho State Park. Um, if I wanted to do something, uh, if I wanted to uh, create a petition to change this name, how would I go about that? We we will get back to you. <laughs> Fill out that form. Uh, you know, take right. You know, take take down those steps. Uh, that we talked about earlier, and we know each other, Britt. So we will look into it. And um, I feel like I've heard of that Stonewall Mine. It's sort of in East County, and mm -hmm. um, it's uh, I've heard I've heard I believe that there's been there's been like petitions and whatnot to their previous petitions to to um i don't know rename it or uh reckon with it in some way i i can't think of any specific details but i'm i definitely read about that before and thank you for bringing it up and we will we will talk about it and we will get to work good. thank you yeah thank you Uh, yes, actually, if I may, if you check that worksheet that we linked to in the chat, step five has a bunch of links to different online um, websites that uh, have petition um, functionality in them. So like change.org is a big one that we've all probably used at least one point in time to sign a petition um, and most likely have seen it. Um, care to I petitions. I've even seen people in DSA use Google Forms. Um, so you just put the content of your position, your petition in at the top of the form, and then just put the fields in the Google Form that you want them to fill out, you know, their name, email address, maybe a title, something like that. And then when you um, use Google Forms, everything goes into a spreadsheet in the back end. So you'll have a list of all the names of signers. So um, 
one of the step one of the check boxes in step five is about printing out a list of the signatories and then mailing them um, which eric has found to be really effective i think he mentioned that in his presentation about um sarah jacobs um, recognizing that he did that as well so a lot of these these uh, services on here many of them are free and you'll you can also get that list of signatories if you wanted to print them out and send them in the mail for an even bigger impact great thank you oh and we have a comment um, from Brian Jenkins, one thing he learned with the uh, change peti petition is that you cannot collect the emails, so you can only connect with the supporters through their campaign update function. So that's actually a really good point. Um, you will have to do your research on these services to see what works best for you, depending on what it is that you're looking for. If you don't need, um, you know, to collect email addresses, that's fine. But you know, most likely you're going to want to interact with these people somehow. Um, and with email addresses, you can find them on socials and things like that. And Eric's on stack, so I'll let him go ahead. Yeah, and another thing that I noticed when talking with, I'm not sure if I was talking with Brian, but, you know, like uh, like even, even the change.org petition, they say that you're supposed to be able to send your email directly to your, your you know, your legislator or your decision maker. But a lot of times they get stuck in the spam filter. And uh, so like literally printing it out is not only like going to get their attention, but it might be the only way to get their attention. But Gil, I think I believe I just Gil just posted that posted a stack just now. So and I'll, I'll let I'll let Gil talk. Thank you. Yeah, I was trying to think of monuments. <clears throat> Uh, that they want us to pledge allegiance to, and I thought about the flag. It's probably the most pervasive monument. It's everywhere. Um, and I don't know what you do about it. Um, Eric um, helped me uh, make a graphic uh, once of uh, an American flag with the words, I want a democratic constitution emblazoned on it. Um, so I don't know. I just thought I'd throw that in there. Um, it, it's, it's a monument we have to change what, 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 it, what the, what the monument, what the flag and what the symbol stands for. Um, so it's anyway, that just popped into my head. Thanks, Gil. Yeah, definitely the flag and pledging allegiance and, and all that stuff. It's like, like even in the ceremony for the post office, they had Girl Scouts pledging allegiance and somebody, you know, a whole Marine Corps band and somebody sang the national anthem, all this stuff. I'm almost glad that I did. I missed my invitation, <laughs> but uh, not really. But um, and briefly, I, I wanted to mention that the uh, the Tilly in, in my hometown back when I was talking about James Titus and Tilly Smith. It's a whole, it's a very local story and sort of somebody's friend wrote a book about it. And there is like a Tilly Smith monument to chastity and, um, uh, and like every, you know, it's like there's, there's ghost hunters come. It's really weird. And the guy who went to jail for like 20 years didn't do it. And, uh, so, you know, monuments, they're like great for the, to build support for politicians, but like. Is it really justice? It's usually not, but um, uh, Heather is on stack. Thank you for letting me finish. Uh, thanks, Eric. I just, I wanted to follow up with uh, Gil's comment. It's funny, I live near an elementary school and um, when I have the windows open or if I'm outdoors in the morning, I can hear the loudspeaker and the every morning before school starts or, or I guess after the bell rings, one of the students is called upon to read the, the Pledge of Allegiance to guide the other students through the P Pledge of Allegiance. And then they have a few other things that they walk through, like that they talk through, like, I am this and I, I you know, pledge to do that. And, it, you know, those types of things are all about like, you know, I'm going to be, you know, respectful of other people and that type of thing. But every time I hear 
the the child leading them through the pledge of allegiance i just cannot help but think it sounds like a cult <laughs> so i'm with you gil <laughs> i hear you <laughs> i just wanted to comment on your uh your comment <laughs> um i know that there was the book that you had mentioned Oh, yeah. um had said something about and i think your original one of your original drafts had said something about allegiance um so that's why it was really interesting yeah. that gil brought that up uh there was a quote in there something about allegiance to the monuments yeah um there mm, it was in it i left it i didn't actually say it out loud but it was in one of the slides maybe i could find it monuments aren't history lessons they're pledges of allegiance mm. Yeah, because what uh, I noticed that when, you know, it's in the news and everything, and like w the only opposition were like, "Oh no, you're erasing history! You're erasing history!" There's a monument on the building, and how are the children going to know that? You know, that you know, I don't know that all these monsters weren't great men, were great men, and all this stuff. And it, but like, it's not. It's it's propaganda. You know, and it's and it's nine times out of ten, it's uh, it's there to cover something up. You know, um, you know, I, especially when it's like uh, when it's like a president or, or something, because like, I mean, it all eras. You know, there's no there's no innocent eras. So, like everybody has every all the politicians have blood in their hands in a kind of way. So, if you're gonna be now, be like uh you know um giving them honors and all this stuff it's like they better you know you better have a good reason for it you know uh my dad was just a local guy who you know we were kind of you know it was a pretty nice neighborhood we we're kind of upper middle class and and all that stuff and it was definitely a big privilege to be in a town where where they could do that and it just happened to be in a lot of ways it was the right place right time and you know, my dad was a pretty great guy, you know. If he, but um, you know, it's it's it, I don't know. I like to I think I think it was one of the drafts I wrote, like um, you know, if there were if there were like uh my if you could put the odds on uh like good like monuments to good people and monuments to that are designed to cover up crimes. I bet the the colonizers would win, but thank you. Um, thank you, Britt, for your comment. Okay, great. Brian wants to talk, please. Okay. No, it's okay. It's all right. It's all good. Brie, please talk, Brian. Is it all right if I talk? Please do. I, you know, yeah. Getting no, I wanted, getting I wanted to ask you this question, Eric, because this is something I thought a lot about is for, you mentioned that I think you moved to the neighborhood in like 2015, 2016. Is that right? 2015. Okay. And so you you looked at the Andrew Jackson post office for five years. What was the catalyst for fine, for kind of having enough and saying, I'm going to do something about this? Because I think this is something that probably everybody relates to, that we see these things, we walk past them all the time. So, like, you know, where, what was it for you that made you say, I'm going to try doing something about this? Thank you. And absolutely, it was the, it was the George Floyd events in June 2020. I remember seeing uh, there was a statue in Bristol that got thrown in. There's a picture in the in one of the uh, the picture of that is one of the first uh, slides in our presentation. There was a stat. There was a statue of, of in Bristol of a slave, uh, some kind of slave trader, and um, I thought that was amazing. I spent a little bit of time in near near Bristol um, about ten years ago. I was there. I was in Cardiff for a month. And um, I was like, yeah, that's awesome. Um, you know, and uh, we learned a lot. There was there were things that. And there are there are people like uh, there were some really creative things that I didn't get to put in the slides. There was um, there's a lot of tobacco lords in Glasgow were uh, had been named after had had a lot of streets named after him. So people like sort of went took it on upon themselves to um you know create very nice looking signs that actually were convincing street signs and named it after rosa parks and george floyd and 
Fred Hampton and there was a there was another African immigrant that had been killed in by police in Scotland that like not that long ago that had got a new street sort of uh you know unofficially um and I know in Belgium I don't think I meant I'm not sure I mentioned yeah I think in the beginning you sort of mentioned Belgium that's crazy those those statues that are um but it was the the reason that I was I felt it was like something that I could finally do was that you know because it was happening all over and it was riding a riding a wave and so there was hope that somebody could actually do something and it worked um you know especially with the with the TV stations were begging for they were really looking for stories like that um and now they still are as you know um Brian's been on CBS two or three times now and in the Union Tribune last week and um so um I don't know I just I don't I it is definitely cuz like you know I had a previous experience in Ghana and always sort of been very aware of that stuff and we're very close to the hour so um but yeah but like I knew that right away like f that guy but you know it how did I know there was something I could do about it was definitely the George Floyd deal, you know, and it had been building like there had been a um, plaque in Horton Plaza to Jeff Davis that had been taken down in 2017. Um, I, I took a photo of that. I was going to mention it, but we needed to reserve time. And speaking of time, we are at the hour, so I will let um, I will let Heather take over. If there are no further questions or comments, we will wrap it up. And uh, thank you, Eric, for sharing your experience and your knowledge with us. Uh, very much appreciate that. And thank you to everyone else for being here and participating with us tonight. Uh, this concludes our DSA night school session for March 2024. Thank you, everyone, and have a great night.